President, uh, Prime Minister, distinguished members of the diplomatic community, uh, guests, and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm here to, for a very brief task to welcome you all to our third annual Geopolitics Summit. As on the two previous occasions, I'm happy to say that we at the Danube Institute are delighted to have the Heritage Foundation in Washington as our partner in this event for the second time. Um, uh, and indeed, Heritage is well represented on the program. James Carafano, senior advisor to its president, will be here for the second time. Uh, and I look forward to the remarks he will make in a moment. I look forward also to his hearing his colleagues, John Venable and Dakota Woods, on, as they speak at different points on the program. And I, as it happens, I'm an old heritage graduate myself, so I'm delighted with this partnership. Uh, of course, it is also a great pleasure, always, to welcome Zolt Nemeth, who is Hungary's wisest counselor on foreign policy. Uh, and in both Parliament and the administration, we're grateful that he will open the program with remarks from a Hungarian perspective. Thank you for being here, Zolt. Among the speakers, where we have old friends uh, like Tony Abbott, Australia's former prime minister, still very active uh, in both uh, hemispheres in politics, uh, President Václav Klaus, former president of the Czech Republic and Central Europe's elder statesman, and new friends like Louis Libby, who was the chief advisor to former president, uh, Vice President Dick Cheney in the administration of George W. Bush. Um, but we have a world to cover with distinguished speakers on topics from Algeria to Zimbabwe, and I think it would be a discourtesy of me to linger long at the podium. May I therefore invite James Carafano to the podium to address us. Thank you, John. I have nothing against the Munich Security Forum. I, I'm, I'm, I have, uh, do I have friends here from the Atlantic Council? But they're not, but I love you. Um, Brussels Forum's great, GlobeSec, you name it. But let's be honest, these are institutions and networks that have been around forever, and they do what they've done forever. And I'm not being overly critical, but I think they're failing us. I don't think that we are having the networks and the connectivity uh, and the opportunity to come together to discuss about real serious issues in a sustained serious way, um, to put the politics aside, to not be bounded by what people think are appropriate or what's the, the game of the moment or having bubbles on the screen. Uh, and I am so, and Heritage is so proud to be associated with the Danube uh, Institute to try to create the transatlantic uh, and the inter-free world connectivity that we really need. Real places for real conversations. And I know this is such a success, and I'm so proud of Esteban and John and Melissa because I get third, right, it's the third time, right. Um, you know, we start to see old friends coming back and we are building a community, a community of practice and a network to have discussions, not just among conservative voices across the transatlantic, but, but among serious voices, a space to deal with serious issues, some of which we disagree with, some of which we disagree with a lot, but if we can't get together and discuss them on our terms, in our way, in honest language, then, then we're failing all the people we represent. This is the future of a free civil society in the world. Places like this and things like John and Melissa have built. So we are so honored to be part of that. We are so committed to working with that and we're so excited to see all of you here. And, and with that, I would just say thank you, thank you so much, John and Melissa, for what you've done. And 20 years from now, I hope there is some young whippersnapper that comes up and says, you guys are so old fashioned. You know, we, we need new life because in the, but in the next 20 years, it's places like this and institutions like this and networks like this that if we move forward as a community that is committed to the freedom and prosperity and, uh, and security of our fellow citizens, this, this is where the ideas, this is where the connections, this is where the real momentum will, will happen from. So thank you.
Dear friends, on behalf of Hungary, you are welcome. Enjoy yourself in the next coming days in uh, Budapest. Especially, I would like to express my gratitude to uh, John and Melissa, the Danube Institute, the fantastic Danube Institute, uh, which has put uh, the Hungarian uh, foreign policy thinking on the map. Uh, in a way, as James Carafano was just suggesting on behalf of uh, the other organizer heritage, yes, there is a, a conservative Christian democratic thinking on global matters as well. Time for diplomacy, that is the title of my uh, short introduction. The Hiroshima G7 summit, the Vilnius NATO summit, the Ukraine conference in Jeddah, the BRICS summit in Johannesburg, the G20 summit in New Delhi. These are the recent events that have rearranged the world's momentary geopolitical landscape in 2023. On Ukraine and on many other issues such as how to deal with China, the G7 members showed unprecedented unity in the consultation process organized by the Japanese presidency in the spring. I would like to welcome the Japanese ambassador among us. It has become clear that the Western powers do not expect Ukraine to make territorial concessions to Russia in order to achieve a ceasefire and are even prepared uh, to, uh, not to do so. And they have also made it clear that China is seen as a uh, rival and challenge in many areas, but not an enemy like Russia. The G7 made it also clear that they intend to work with China both economically and in building a new world order. The Jeddah conference on the settlement in Ukraine was attended by a very wide range of countries from around the world, including China, although not at the highest level, but officially they were present. They collectively stated that the basis for the settlement in Ukraine should be uh, the territorial integrity of states. That is, this very broad group of countries assured Ukraine that they would not expect also territorial concessions in return for a ceasefire similar to G7. So in Jeddah, the world recognized the legitimacy of the Ukrainian counterattack, which uh, had been already taking place at that time. Although Hungary was not represented at this event, and as you know, Hungary has a very unique, strong pro-peace pro stance, the conclusion of the conference is in line with the Hungarian position as Hungary stands on the ground of Ukraine's territorial integrity and the right to self-defense. And China's participation in the Jeddah Forum, it was no wonder that uh, BRICS did not stand up for Russia in Johannesburg, a uh, member of that grouping. Uh, their closing statement said that all reiterated their positions on the war in Ukraine. They disagreed on the issue. The BRICS final statement, however, was very careful not to say anything that would have made it impossible for BRICS members to cooperate with G7 in the future. Some of the members had already de facto cooperated with the seven. Note that India and Brazil were invited to the G7 summit in Hiroshima that they accepted. Based on all of this, it seemed at the end of the summer that the bipolar world order polarity was emerging, with G7 on one side and BRICS on the other, both rivaling and engaging in dialogue with each other. At least that would have been the case if all the BRICS members had gone to the G7, G20 summit in September just a few weeks ago, at the highest level, at which G7 were also present. However, Putin did not go, sent Lavrov. And uh, Xi, President Xi did not go either. Only Premier Li Qiang did. 
The United States, on the other hand, was represented at the highest level in the person of President Biden. The Indians really did their best to have everyone, from Putin to Xi and to Biden there. They did this not only out of vanity, I guess, but also because it would have essentially put them in the middle of the map of world politics. They would have become the great mediator. In other words, it would no longer have been the BRICS, uh, the opposite pole of G7, but rather just uh, Chinese-Russian axis, while India would have been in a kind of comfortable intermediary role, essentially together with Brazil and to some extent with the newly emerging African Union in the G20, so essentially the global south together. This is what Chinese did not sign up for. They probably didn't go for it, not only because the intermediary role would have greatly enhanced India, their old rival. More importantly, it seems that neither China nor Russia could have wanted a dialogue in which they would have been marginalized because it would have become clear that they have no such a strong substantive camp, while America has the relatively united G7 and all allies, allies such as South Korea and Australia. It was perfectly understandable and logical for China and Russia to avoid this, but it was not without cost. The price is that G20 has become effectively, at least temporarily, a joint platform of democratic powers of the global north and the global south. But only the democracy, democratic ones, in which China and Russia have only a kind of outsider, somewhat instant, uh, distant quasi-observer status. A world order thus is emerging in which the G7 is relatively unified and very tightly integrated and uh, uh, at a relatively narrow inner core while the G20 is the much looser, much broader outer layer with the Russians and the Chinese as quasi-observers with the possibility of adapting to the collective decisions of the others. This emerging alternative world order will therefore not necessarily be bipolar, but concentric, like an onion. You could call it an onion world order. How does all this relate to Ukraine's freedom struggle, dear friends, dear colleagues, which is in the midst of our thinking? Unfavorably. According to the Ukrainians, they took it very badly that they were not invited to New Delhi and that the G20 final declaration did not condemn Russian aggression as openly as the G7 Hiroshima declaration. However, in my opinion, this is, again, a strategic misjudgment and miscommunication on behalf of the Ukraine. As after the Vilnius summit for a couple of days, they were also quite disoriented. What the soft declaration achieved was to force Russia to marginalize itself. No one could say that the West had made its participation impossible. Putin himself had to consider it better to stay away. This is better for Ukraine than allowing Putin to blame others for uh, the failure. Russia has passed, in my opinion, another milestone on its way to losing its superpower super status. Ukraine's other strategic miscommunication was to exaggerate expectations of a counter-offensive. Because of this, the world sees the relatively slow progress of the counter-offensive offensive as a failure. In fact, the Minister of Defense was replaced in Ukraine exactly because of this. All this is being exploited brilliantly by the Russian propaganda to spread the idea that Ukraine is wasting human lives needlessly when it comes when it has no uh, chance against Russian military technology and superiority of resources. However, dear friends, colleagues, 
the reality is that the counter attack is progressing, progressing, albeit obviously relatively slowly. That is, uh, in my opinion, the trend has reserved. Until now, the Russians pushed the front from east to west. Now, the Ukrainians are pushing the front from west to east. A possible momentum uh, for world politics, a possible momentum for diplomacy. Probably, why not opening serious diplomatic negotiations under these circumstances? Therefore, we can say that the developments in, in geopolitical forums and the state of the freedom struggle in Ukraine complement each other. Both point in the direction of the development of the onion world order in which, unless this process is reversed, there might be concentric circles rather than polarity, dialogue rather than confrontation. The big question, however, remains for international peace and security. It is increasingly how sustainable such an onion-layered world order, whether China can find its place in this order or, now really cemented with Russia, will feel compelled and able to upset it. We can hope, and probably more. We need to work on that. China will, will be able to find its place, which I believe is likely to happen, as the price of the other option could indeed easily be extremely expensive, if not a nuclear world war. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>